<laughs> Dr. Verma, Dr. Chala, thank you for joining. We'll, we'll, we'll do this again. We'll run it through again. Um, do you guys mind introducing yourselves uh, to everyone? And then we'll go sure. from there. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, first of all, thanks for hosting and thanks for having us. So Sounds like we got over our technical difficulties, but uh, my name is Dr. Uh, Nick Verma. I'm an orthopedic sports medicine specialist, uh, the director of sports medicine at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago and Midwest Orthopedics at Rush. I'm the head team physician for the Chicago White Sox and an assistant team physician for the Chicago Bulls. I'm Dr. Jorge Chal. I'm joining here the practice at Midwest Orthopedics at Rush uh, from August on, and I'm going to be doing mainly knees and, and hip pathology. And I've done quite a bit of research on biologics topic as well, so this is, a, this is one of my favorite topics. Awesome. I, I'm stoked to have you guys on. I know a lot of our audiences, too. This is um, the new wave of a lot of the new medicine, regenerative medicine, and just sports medicine as a whole. And I think it's a big topic that a lot of people don't know much about. So I'm happy to have you guys on and share your knowledge um, and just get a little bit of the information out there. So thank you for joining. Um, let's start with this. What are biologics in a nutshell um, for those that don't have any idea of what it may be? So that's a great question. You know, as you said, this is such a hot topic in orthopedics today. I, I would guess that from our online platform, this is probably a third of the questions that we get. And we generally see somewhere between five to seven patients in the office who are coming in specifically to ask us about a biologic treatment and is it applicable for their condition. So mm. I think that we'll continue to hear more and more about this. But so if you think about what we do in orthopedics today, it's really about symptom management and or repairing tissue. So if you have arthritis, we try to manage your symptoms and make you feel better. If you have an ACL tear, we try to uh, reconstruct or repair your ACL tear. And the same thing goes for a rotator cuff or other conditions that involve the shoulder, the elbow, the knee. What really the promise of biologics is, is how can we not necessarily repair, but how can we improve the repair process and in some cases, how can we actually regenerate tissue? So rather than just treating the symptoms of an arthritic knee, how can we actually make the body regenerate cartilage or start to regenerate new cartilage? Um, <clears throat> that's the promise of biologics, but unfortunately that's not necessarily where we are in biologics today. So biologics is a new treatment formula where basically what we're doing is trying to harness the, potty, the power of our own body's healing process, whether that's by using cells, or signaling uh, molecules or growth factors or other biologic avenues to try to get the body to do something that we want. So a good example is in rotator cuff surgery, right? When we repair a rotator cuff, what we do is, is repair the tendon back down to the bone using a mechanical construct. So that's something like anchors that go into the bone and then sutures that repair the tendon back into place. When that healing process occurs, it occurs via scar tissue. So you don't get a normal interface between the tendon and the bone, but similarly to when you cut your skin and then develop a scar, you get scar tissue that forms between the tendon and the bone. The idea with biologics is how can we start to harness the power of our own body to try to regenerate that interface? So can we make it look more normal? Can we regenerate what is a normal tendon bone interface? Can we accelerate the healing process so that patients don't have to be in a sling for four weeks and, and have six months to recover? And most importantly is, can we improve the patient outcome? So at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is to make patients function better and feel better so that they can return to the things that they love, whether that's sports, recreational activities, or just activities of their daily living or things that they're required to do for their job. So that's the promise of biologics. But as I think we'll talk about during this uh, seminar is, what's the reality? Um, where are we now? And where are we potentially going with this type of treatment? Yeah, so many cool avenues. I think it, and it's important to know that you know, no matter what someone is doing for, in terms of interventions or treatment approach, the goal at the end of the day is we're improving your patient outcomes. You're improving your ability to get off, off the ground, to go play with your dad, to go play with your kids, to go play sports. Now that's at the end of the day, it's most important. There are many ways to get to that goal. And today, one of those ways that we're going to talk about are biologics. So biologics as a, as a term, I think, let's go the other way. Yeah. <laughs> How about if we do this? Will this work? The sideways would work. The only issue is that with Instagram, well, actually, I can turn mine, but then the actually no, because then we can't see the comments. The comments okay. are sideways. All right, yeah. we're trying to plug in a charging cord. Oh yeah. That, okay. Go ahead. If you, if you have to, you guys can just hold hold the phone with the charging cord. Okay. Um, but let's do this. So that's a great overview of biologics. Um, the terms that maybe people are, hear more in the media will, will be things like PRP, stem cells. BMAC, things like that. Let's talk about kind of what those are because I think those are the terms that more people are familiar with. 
um, and what they are in a nutshell, and then what are the differences between them? Let's let's start with that. So there are basically three categories of biologics. The first one is PRP, which is a blood-derived product. Basically, you have a patient come into clinic, have some of the peripheral blood drawn, and then once you have that, you spin the blood to create uh, a more <coughs> concentrated form of, of the blood, which is rich in platelets, right? And that's what platelet-rich plasma means. It's a, it's a compound that has more platelets than the baseline, than the blood baseline. However, when you think about it, we don't even know if we need the platelets to begin with. We are assuming that, that they're gonna deliver growth factors and all this good stuff for healing. But there are a couple of studies now showing that if you have too many platelets or too much platelets, then the, outcomes is actually, the outcome is actually worse. Mm. We did a study where we basically look at 160 rabbits. We did a, uh, an MCL tear and then we did nothing. So just left it the way it was. Then we injected PPP, which is platelet poor plasma, PRP two times the baseline and four times. And what we saw is that when we get to the, the more platelets group, so four times the baseline, they did worse, even than, than, the, than the group that didn't have anything done. So it is important that we understand that we don't even know how much platelets we have, we need for it to make a good impact. However, we know that if we have probably one or two times the amount of platelets, it can sometimes produce some um, good healing or at least have a, a good effect on inflammation. There are mainly two indications where we know this is true. One is mild to moderate osteoarthritis of the knee. There are at least 14 randomized clinical trials now showing that it's better than their controls, meaning that it's better than cortisone injections, than doing nothing, physical therapy, or AHA, hyaluronic acid. And also for lateral elbow epicondylitis, which there are at least 12 randomized clinical trials showing that it's a pretty good and durable treatment for those patients. The second group is BMAC, is bone aspirate uh, concentration. And basically what we do is go to the iliac crest or to the tibia, the humeral um, head. And what we do is extract bone marrow. And what we do is do the ba basically the same process as we do with the PRPs, centrifuging the, the bone marrow and getting the, the growth factors. Now the, the amount of cells, of stem cells that that compound has is very minimal they say it's between 0.01% and 0.001%, which is around 50,000 cells. So you're basically not selecting anything, just spinning your bone marrow and getting the, the growth factors in the cells. The difference between BMAC and PRP is that BMAC has more leukocytes, but it also has one thing called interleukin-1 receptor antagonist, which is a pretty powerful anti-inflammatory. And that's why some people get more relief in the beginning of the treatment. However, it's more, more painful from the harvesting standpoint. Can you and go, third, oh, sorry, go for it, go for it. And the third group is stem cells per se. Uh, what we do when we do stem cells is basically selecting the cells that can generate progeny, meaning, meaning which are the cells that can replicate as a, at a faster uh, pace. And also that they can differentiate into cartilage, bone, or, or uh, fat tissue, right? So they have the power to go anywhere, basically. And once you have identified those cells, what you do is you multiply them several times until you have 50, 60 million cells. That's not FDA approved. And that's why when people say, I got stem cells treat treatment, it's probably not stem cells what they got, but they got uh, bone marrow aspirate, which has a minimal amount of cells. But it's a pretty good anti-inflammatory. A mm. couple, couple other points that I would stress. Number one is, is Jorge did a very good job of giving you an overview of what the contents are or what the types of biologics that are out there. But you have to remember, when you get a PRP injection, you're not just getting platelets. When you get a BMAC injection, you're not just getting stem cells. There are a whole lot of other products, red blood cells, white blood cells, other plasma contents that exist within these products. And that's part of the reason that we have a, a difficult time understanding what's important and what's not. It's because it's likely a multifactorial approach. <clears throat> and similarly, you know, there are, there are products that create these products. So for example, there are uh, multiple different um, uh, companies that make products to create PRP or make products to create BMAC. And when they do that, they each create a different concentration of platelets, for example, a different concentration of white blood cells, a different concentration of red blood cells. 
And so it's very difficult to, to compare one PRP product versus another PRP product. And in fact, the preparation that you use for one diagnosis may not be applicable to a second diagnosis. So for something like osteoarthritis, where you're trying to decrease inflammation, you, want, you may want a, a certain formulation of PRP. But for something like a rotator cuff tear, where you're trying to stimulate inflammation to rev up the healing process, you may want a different concentration of PRP. So we can't just think about this in simplistic terms about I got PRP or I got stem cells, but sometimes really what kind of PRP or what kind of stem cells you got is important. The second thing that I think gets lost in this whole discussion is the product that you have is just one factor in the equation. The other factor in the equation is how do we deliver it and when do we deliver it? So part of the problem that we have in learning about this is can it really be as simple as injecting it into the repair site and expecting that stem cell or that platelet or that growth factor to actually work the way that it's supposed to work. And do we need it right when we do the repair or do we need it six weeks later? Or do we need it 12 weeks later? And maybe it's such that we need one product right when we do the repair and another product six weeks later and another product 12 weeks later. And maybe we have to use some type of a fibrin product where we can actually uh, sew it into the repair site so it sits exactly between the tendon and the bone. These are all questions that we haven't figured out yet. And I think that gives you a sense of why we're really at the infancy of biologics. And we have so much to learn about all of these different topics or, or um, specific factors about how and when these biologics work and when they're effective and when they're not. That's awesome. I, I think it's, it's, so, it's so cool just to see where, where we've come from, I guess you can say, over the last 20 years. But still, then it opens the door to how much more there is to learn, how much more we need to learn to figure out what's the best way to utilize um, this intervention. I want and, to and I want a little. Your, yeah, go for I it. Think to your point, you know, what really is exciting to most of us about biologic therapy is it represents the next step in how do we do a better job of treating patients, right? So if you yeah. think about where we were and where we've come from, in large part, we've kind of maximized what we're able to achieve from a mechanical standpoint. Knee replacements, the, the majority of improvement in prostheses and the way the surgery is done and the way the implants are cemented or put into position the types of product, the plastics that are being used um, as the bearing surface for replacements. We've, we've come a long way in that, but we probably are reaching the 95th or 97th percentile of the types of improvements that can be made. Mm -hmm. Really, the next step is how do we go from just repairing tissue to restoring tissue? And that, that's where the promise of biologics lie. The problem is that at this point, it's, it's a fairly unregulated field. Um, there's really not a lot of regulation that's involved when you take something out of a person and inject it back into the person at the same time frame. And so a lot of claims are out there about how we can cure arthritis or how we can um, reverse rotator cuff tears or do things that we certainly know we can't do with biologics at this stage. So you really have to be careful and ask the hard questions about what are they using? Why are they using it? What's the data that they have to support that it actually works for the condition that you have? I definitely want us to touch on regulations and claims um, in a bit because you bring up a really good point that it's it, there's not as much um, I don't want to call it the wild wild west but you know there's not as much regulation on this as maybe there are on other things right now. But it I want to rewind wild. back to yeah, <laughs> it is. I uh, want to rewind a little bit back to what you said about inflammation. How you may have certain certain conditions like osteoarthritis where you are going to want to limit inflammation, but you may have other issues like. Um, chronic tendinopathies or something like that, where you want to speed up the inflammatory process. And I think a question that we get asked for a correlation, that's not a correlation, but people have the assumption that inflammation is always a bad thing, but it's not always a bad thing. Can you guys go ahead and explain how inflammation is one of the things that you guys are targeting or that biologics target and how it actually is part of the natural healing process? And that's kind of what we're trying to um, tap into with some of these biologics. Sweet. The healing process has four phases. The first phase of healing is inflammation. The problem is when you have a chronic entity or a chronic disease, then that first phase is lost. So the body doesn't recognize that as a new disease or as a new injury, and therefore doesn't go and heal it. So what you, what you basically try to do when you inject this PRP with multiple or with a several amount or a big amount of leukocytes or uh, white blood cells is probably trigger that first phase so, can, so that the whole healing phase can start. Does that make sense? So let's say you have a lateral elbow, elbow epicondylitis and it's been there for years, right? And you've done some physical therapy but doesn't seem to make it better. Then if you do a PRP injection, your first aim will be to create inflammation, which means that it's gonna be 
pretty painful for the patient for the probably two, three days after the injection. And then that healing phase is going to lead to the rest of the three phases of the repair mm -hmm. process. So it's basically just triggering the healing process from the first phase on. Yeah, I think one of, one of the important things to think about is why did these injuries happen in the first place? And if you look at a common denominator in many of the soft tissue injuries that we treat today, the common denominator is that they occur in an area where there's relatively low blood supply, which means that degeneration happens over time. There's not enough blood supply being delivered to the area for the body to then initiate a reparative process, as Jorge spoke about. And so over time, you get chronic fatigue that then results in ultimately a rupture of your Achilles tendon or a rupture of your rotator cuff um, or a tear of your biceps, for example. And so what we're trying to do with, with um, either a growth factor type product or a, uh, a cellular type product is to initiate an inflammatory response and to bring uh, blood products, blood supply back into the area. So one of the key ways that we think some of these products work is by creating a process called angiogenesis. And angiogenesis is very simply put is stimulating the body to lay down new capillary blood vessels to bring blood supply back into the area to allow a healing process to occur. So you're trying to create uh, an area that's very uh, devoid of, of blood products and blood supply and create an area that's very rich in blood products and blood supply. That's an awesome that point, I think it's important that moving forward, we need to customize our PRP, right? Because PRP has so many growth factors that sometimes do the opposite thing, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, PRP has something called BEGF. That's one of the growth <clears throat> factors which speaks to what Dr. Verma was saying, create more vessels in the damaged tissue. But if you want to repair cartilage, for example, cartilage is an avascular tissue, meaning that you don't want vessels to be there. And if you do, it, it becomes a really bad repair tissue. So moving forward, let's say that we want to inject something in the knee, we'll have to block that to be able to create a better tissue, a better repair tissue, if that makes sense. So now there's some animal studies showing that if you actually block those things and you block fibrosis, for example, then the repair tissue that you get is better. Whereas if you inject the whole PRP, it's like a shotgun approach where you're yeah. trying to heal some, something with multiple things that probably you don't need. Got it. Well, that speaks again to what you guys are saying in the literature and the research, why it's so hard to make comparisons between studies or make uh, stronger statements just because every study is going to be looking at different things, with different constituents, um, yeah. you know, what they're injecting, or how they're injecting, and the techniques they're using to inject. So uh, actually, we looked into this, and only from 105 articles in the literature talking about PRP, there, there's only 11% that reports on every single thing that you need to replicate the study. Mm -hmm. So people won't tell you which machine they use sometimes, uh, which piece do they use, how many spins do they do, how they inject these things. So it's really hard to compare the outcomes if you don't have a baseline that you, you need to use to compare this. And yeah. to that point, we, we created some guidelines for people to report on so we can have the same outcome measures that we can actually compare. Yeah. And then, you know, you add on top of that, you layer on top of that, what we call host factors, right? So how does our ability to harvest stem cells change from a 16 year old to a 60 year old? Um, how do factors like diabetes and hypertension and smoking play a role in what these products look like and how do they work? So again, I hope what we're laying um, kind of an outline for you is the fact that this is not as simple as showing up in your doctor's office <laughs> and saying, I want some stem cells in my knee because I've got arthritis. There's so many layers to the different factors that are going to affect either a positive outcome or a negative outcome. And most of them, unfortunately, we just don't completely understand at this point. Going off what you said about the literature and compiling some of those studies that actually go through the methods so you can start to make those comparisons. If we look at the body of literature right now, are there any conditions, certain conditions? We had a lot of questions from our audience about certain conditions of when PRV can be used, when stem cell can be used. Um, and like you said, it's going to be very individualized to that person, to what exactly they're getting done. Um, but are there certain areas of the body based on what you said on blood flow and inflammation that you think um, some of these biologics may be more promising than others, or maybe where the literature has showed, you know, trends towards being more promising than others? Yeah, or a, or a, it's already commented on this, but you want to take that? Sure. Th there's a couple of things that are more promising at this point. Um, mild to moderate osteoarthritis is one of the, of the fields that has the most literature. There's at least, at least 14 randomized clinical trials showing that it's beneficial in comparison to cortisone injections, to hyaluronic acid injections, to placebo, to a physical therapy. And it's a durable 
and he's speaking specifically about PRP now, not Correct. stem cells. So we're just yeah. talking about PRP. Just PRP. Yes, and basically what you what you get is a patient that has mild to moderate OA. So basically, if you have more OA, bone on bone arthritis, then these therapies are less likely to work. So the less you have, the more chances you have that this is going to work. And basically, what study says says is that if you have three injections, it's better than if you have one. And the mean duration of, of the symptom relief is nine months. Okay. Regarding BMAC, there's just only one randomized clinical trial, which is double-blinded out of Mayo Clinic, which, in which they took 25 patients with bilateral osteoarthritis. They injected saline on one knee and uh -huh. BMAC on the other knee. And the outcomes were the same. So the data is quite not there yet for BMAC, but most, more for PRP. Yeah, I think, I think a good summary would be to say, if we just break it down for PRP, good data is for tendinopathy or tendinitis type conditions, which include things like um, patellar tendinitis, lateral epicondylitis, and for osteoarthritis, as Jorge said, which is mild to moderate osteoarthritis. Those are the two places where we have reasonable clinical data to suggest that it works. The second is in rotator cuff tears, where I would say that the data quality is medium, but there is some reasonable clinical data that suggests, particularly for smaller tear sizes, that there can be some advantage of using um, PRP as opposed to um, uh, uh, not using PRP in the setting of rotator cuff repair. I would say that there is no data that suggests that PRP will actually heal or reverse any of the conditions that we're talking about. So it's important to recognize that all we're talking about at this point is symptom management and not actually repairing tissue in any way, shape, or form. And then I would say the summary for BMAC is the fact that there is absolutely no clinical data at this point that would substantiate to a high level of clinical certainty that it has efficacy in any conditions that we treat routinely in orthopedics. That doesn't mean that it doesn't work. That just means that at this point, we really don't have the data to be able to conclusively say to our patients that this is going to work well for your condition given factors A, B, and C. What we do know about BMAC is that it's relatively safe. There are very little uh, side effects associated with it, generally local, local soreness from the harvest site, uh, as well as potentially some inflammatory reaction to where uh, we inject it, uh, risk of infection from where we inject it, but that's similar to any type of injectable product what, uh, that we use. So we know it's safe, we just don't know if it's efficacious at this point. Would you agree with those comments? Yeah, 100%. The only tendinopathy that doesn't have good literature on is Achilles tendinopathy. There are four studies, randomized clinical trials, showing that there's no difference between using PRP versus their controls. And there's one surgical one where they augmented the repair with PRP and it showed to be detrimental. So if really? there's one tendinopathy where we should be more careful would be Achilles tendinopathy. Any idea why, the, why the authors think that or is it weight-bearing joint or? Probably, it's probably because of the load, right? Like right. a rotator cuff doesn't sustain the load yeah. that a, the Achilles has. And also because the very tendon, the, the Achilles tendon is probably one of the most different tendons from the body. It's actually a unique uh, structure. So therefore, that could be you know, the explanations why PRP or bio biological injections don't work as well. Awesome. So we covered PRP right there. We covered BMAC um, and then stem cell. Do we have um, a lot of literature on that or, or because it's not FDA approved, like you mentioned, we, we don't have a lot of those studies that we can even see any trends towards it one way or the other? So, so just, to, just to make sure we're using consistent nomenclature, B, BMAC is stem cell. It's bone marrow aspirate concentrate, which is basically that we're harvesting the bone marrow where stem cells live, and then we're concentrating it to try to take you know, usually what we do is harvest about 60 cc's of bone marrow, so 60 milliliters of bone marrow, about a, you know, a, a half cup or so, and we concentrate that down into about um, two to four milliliters of, of bone marrow aspirate concentrate, which contains stem cells among other um, either pro or anti-inflammatory uh, markers or transducers. Um, okay. Jorge can talk about this as well, but you know what's, what the second thing that's important to recognize is that there are other groups of products that we would consider what we call allografts, which means there are off-the-shelf products that come from other people that are being used as injections. Originally, these have in large part been billed as stem cell, quote-unquote, injections. Most of them come from human placenta. Um, 
they're either cryo preserved or otherwise preserved so that they can be injected as an off the shelf product. Meaning you come into your doctor's office, they say, we think this product may help you. They pull it off the shelf or out of the freezer and then they inject it into your body somewhere. What's important to recognize is as far as we know, and I'll let Jorge comment on this because he's done some of the work here, is that none of these products actually contained live cells. Now that doesn't mean that they don't work, but it means that you probably aren't getting a true live cell stem cell product. There may be other things that signal either pro-inflammation uh, or anti-inflammation that help with things like healing or symptom reduction, uh, but they're really not truly stem cell project, products. That's a good point. So all these placental tissue, amniotic stem cells that they claim, if you look into the websites, they can't claim that because that's, that wouldn't be FDA approved. But we get a lot of that when we see the, the reps and they say, well, you have 2 million cells in this thing right here that you can shake and, and stuff. And if you have done any work in the lab, you have to understand that growing cells is really difficult and make them st stay live. And, and it's like really hard to grow them and really hard to maintain those cells alive. So it is really hard to think that those cells are going to be living in a shelf for five years just standing in, in, in that fluid. As Dr. Verma said, it doesn't mean that doesn't work, but there might be some other things such as growth factors and, and other proteins that are doing the effect and not necessarily the stem cells with, with it. So really, if we're going to use broad categories, probably there are three different categories. One is PRP. One is stem cell concentrate, which can come from two places. We most commonly use <clears throat> stem cell concentrate that comes from bone marrow, but you can also get it from adipose tissue. So it's almost like a mini liposuction type procedure. Um, where you take a little bit of fat and then you, you stimulate the fat to break up the fat and harvest the stem cells. And then the third is what we should call, um, in the large part, they're placenta-based products. So they basically come from human placentas that have been donated from uh, mothers after they've given birth and contain some element of a healing process. We don't really know for sure what's in all of these products. Yeah. In large part, they're proprietary based, which means they haven't been tested independently. Mm. So it's very hard for us as investigators to really verify what's in a product and what's not in a product. But I think it, it would be safe to say at this point that most of the, if not all of the placental based products are not cellular based. They don't have actually live cells as part of them. Wow. It's interesting, yeah, because when you look at the consumer-facing things, the websites, the social media channels, the things that you know the consumer sees, you don't get any of this information, you don't get any of this insight, you don't, you don't see any of this at all, you know. Um, but it's really important that we're out there educating people that it's not this gold ticket that all of a sudden just came out of nowhere. Then we can trust all these things. Um, how is it that there are products out there? I know FDA approval listings, or it, it goes down a rabbit hole, but there's will there ever be a way that, you know, the consumer will know and be a way to be able to validate a lot of these claims that companies make so that they're more informed and more educated, or will it have to be from discussions like what we're having today where the consumers and our patients are going to be more educated on the things that they hear online or the things that they hear on the ads and, and things like that. That's our hope. I think by doing these things and by writing multiple articles saying, this is what we have, this is the data that we know, um, this is the safest thing that we can use these things on. I think that's, that's the way to try to ameliorate or at least improve what we have right now, which is the wild, wild west, as Dr. Verma outlined. <laughs> the other thing is that we're now creating the, the clinical practice guidelines again from the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. And we'll come out with some recommendations based on the literature. I think that's going to be a big uh, undertaking, but at, at the same time, it's going to be a good thing for the lay person and also for the orthopedic surgeons that are not well aware of the literature. So I, I, I would just make a couple of further comments. Number one is it, it's clear that the FDA is, uh, is aware that this is a problem. And I think you'll see more and more that there will be um, FDA, I don't want to call it investigation, but FDA scrutiny about yeah. advertising and claims that are made about products that are being used. Um, so you may see some of the common names in stem cell treatment being challenged on some of the claims they, they make during advertising sessions, whether that's online, infomercials, printed material, et cetera. So I think we'll see that being clamped down on number one. Number two is we have to differentiate between stuff that comes from you and stuff that comes from somebody else, because the stuff that comes from you is different, it is regulated uh, under a different pathway than stuff that comes from somebody else. The stuff that comes from you, the FDA guidance uh, is such that 
basically as long as you use it in a manip minimally, minimally manipulated format. That is, you take it out of the body, it doesn't leave the area where the harvest was done, it doesn't have to go to an outside lab for processing, it doesn't come back three or four days later, you can centrifuge it so that you can uh, concentrate it, but you can't manipulate it um, further than that and then re-inject it back into the body. That seems to be an okay process. And number two is what we're gravitating to is it has to be like tissue, meaning that you can't take, uh, for example, tissue from your bone and then use it for an ap application in your, your gut. It has to go from a, a musculoskeletal condition to a musculoskeletal condition. So those are the, the two broad categories that the FDA looks at to determine if a process, if a, if a, a product meets the criteria where it can be, uh, where you don't have to go through a regulatory process in order to use it. If, if it becomes more than minimally manipulated, or if it is a non-like tissue, or if it comes from somebody else, then it goes through a much higher level of regulatory process to be able to be used uh, clinically. A lot of a lot of ways that you know that we're trying to clamp well, clamp down is maybe the wrong word, but yeah, clamp down and just stay as regulated as we can, which is awesome. Um, and hopefully, Go conversations ahead. like this that we're having will be able to educate people. Um, so, so you guys know we're going to turn this into an article. We'll have a lot of this information out there for people in easily digestible reading format so people can uh, stay as on top of this as they can. Um, go ahead and what, what did you have to say, Dr. Shala? I think, you know, I think one of the things that I would just tell patients is to make sure they're asking the tough questions, right? Because they, they will often see a provider or a stem cell clinic per se that's going to make claims about what, you know, what, um, what they're offering. Um, yeah. And sometimes when we hear about the prices that are being charged for these types of injections, it's, it's insane the amount of money that's actually being spent. And unfortunately, that's what creates some of this litany of misinformation is that there's a lot of profit to be made in this biologic uh, field. And really what it boils down to is everybody's looking for the next best thing because if you have knee arthritis, you don't want to have a knee replacement. I get that. You're looking for that mm -hmm. ability to try to regenerate your own tissue and hopefully we get there at some point. But I think you want to ask hard questions about is the injection I'm getting uh, meant to just treat symptoms or are you actually telling me that it's going to help to cure or regenerate my condition? Um, secondly, is you always want to ask them for some peer reviewed references that actually support the claim that they're making. What's the evidence that you're basing this on and how can I see the evidence and in what formats is the evidence being delivered? So it's not just an, an informational packet that they give you that they produced, but there's actually some scientific basis behind it. Um, in what we consider a peer-reviewed format. That is a format that's been published in an external journal that's unaffiliated with the clinic that you're at and has been um, um, reviewed by a group of authors to say this is legitimate science. Um, and so I think if you start asking some of these difficult questions when you see a provider that's, that's um, interested in providing you with a biologic injection, you'll be able to understand you know, what, what, um, what's best for you. And that's not to say that we get many patients that come in and we tell them, look, we think this, this is experimental. We don't know whether it's going to help you or whether it's not. We don't think it's going to hurt you. Here are the potential benefits associated with that. I don't, don't have any evidence to support that. But if it's something that you want to try, we're happy to make that available to you. And I think that that's the right way that these products need to be used. Yes. I love it. I love it. That's a really good way, really good way to summarize um, kind of what we wanted to talk about. Dr. Chala, do you have any closing statements or Dr. Verma as well? I don't want to take up too much of your guys' time. You know, we're a little bit over right now. So I think Dr. Verma made a great uh, overview of what's going on today in clinic, right? When we have patients coming in to see us just to get a stem cell injection or just to get a PRP injection without knowing that probably that's not going to yield any structural changes to their knees, to their shoulders, but only anti -inflammatory, an anti-inflammatory effect, right? So most of the times, that could be a great thing to have because there's a lot of people walking with rotator cuff tears, meniscus tears, and that doesn't mean that they need to have pain or they're going to have pain ever, right? There's a lot of people that we see from the, from the White Sox, from uh, the NBA that have bone-on-bone -bone arthritis, and then they can play at a high level with no significant pain, no significant symptoms, which means that probably what you see in the MRI doesn't correlate to what you have or to the, to, what the pain, to the pain that you have. So treating the symptoms sometimes is a good thing. That might be all you need, right? To get you out of the edge and then Just move forward edge. without pain. Yeah, the last thing I'll say is if it sounds too good to tr be true, it probably is. That's where we are in <laughs> biologics right now is uh, unfortunately, 
you know, that's the case that we get in the office every day is somebody got told that they're going to have a stem cell injection. It's going to reverse their arthritis. And that's just not the case. Yeah, it is. It is promising. Ho hopefully in our lifetime, I think maybe we'll be able to get there. I mean, if you just think like you were talking about where, where surgeries are gone, where we come from and total hip replacements, total knee replacements just in the last, since I've been alive, I'm 30 years old. They've gone significant, you know, and hopefully with biologics, we'll be able to get there too. Hopeful. <laughs> Absolutely. And, I, and it's not to sound discouraging. It's just to give you a sense of where we are right now. But I think that's why many of us in the, in the orthopedic community are so excited about these products because they actually do give us the potential to offer um, regenerative type treatments. I don't think the use of regenerative medicine is actually accurate where we are in 2019, but mm -hmm. hopefully in 10 years, 15 years, or 20 years, we will actually have regenerative biologics to offer our patients. That's awesome. Let's end it with that. Um, Dr. Verma and Dr. Chala, thank you so much for joining. Um, really, really appreciate you guys' time. This was awesome. This is super informative for all of our audiences. Um, and let's definitely do this again. Thanks for having thank us. Thank you guys. Thank you for having us. Awesome.